Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ASAP demonstration debate. Woo! Featuring Central and Masterman debaters. Woo. We're so excited to have you. My name is Deborah Disbro. I'm the debate manager. And my name is Destiny Colbert. I'm the debate coordinator. Thank you so much for coming today, and we're really excited to get this debate season. So I want to acknowledge all the members of the debate community in the room today. So raise your hand if you're a member of a debate team. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, thank you for supporting your fellow debaters. Raise your hand if you're new to debating. Woohoo! Woo Welcome. And if this is your first year of debating, we hope today will be inspiring to you because this could be you one day. And a special shout out to the student captains. Feel free to stand. Any student captains here in the room? <laughs> Woo! Woohoo! Woo! All right. Thank you for your leadership and hard work. And I'd also like to acknowledge our dedicated debate coaches Woo! who put in extra hours in support of their students. Do you feel like standing? We'd love Yay! to give you a round of applause. <laughs> now, I'd like to introduce our Youth Advisory Board member. The Youth Advisory Board is a group of students and alumni who develop action plans for how ASAP can be a greater force for equity and student well-being. Every voice is important, and we encourage students to apply. Flyers with the link to the application will be out on the registration table. Now, please give a warm welcome to Jaden Gillian, who also just so happens to be one of our debaters today. Okay, um, can I do this? Okay, all right, so I'm going to talk to you guys a bit about the um, Youth Advisory Board. So first, what do we do? We try to make change as like a union um, to the Philadelphia area, to the Philadelphia district. We look to see what part we can improve. We in the past have been involved in things such as like COVID and stuff like that. And we really look towards this year to be invested into our efforts into after school activities, as we are the ASAP Youth Advisory Board. And these projects, they're uh, really, really fun to work on because you really feel like you're making actual change in your community. Um, additionally, um, these students that I work with um, that are part of the Youth Advisory Board are from all across Philly and from all different schools of Philly. We love to have you guys join because then you get a more diverse perspective. Yeah, if you only have people from, say, one school, then you're only getting a one-sided perspective. So having people from a lot of different schools, which is what we currently have now, which creates a really nice environment, really um, would be great. And that, I think, really makes the Youth Advisory Board such a great environment. And then... Lastly, I do want to say when I do do stuff as part of the Youth Advisory Board and I do do stuff with the Youth Advisory Board, I feel like I'm actually making change. I feel like it goes beyond the um, premise, the borders that I have in my high school. I feel like I could actually go out there and see the impacts of my actions, of my ideas, put into material. And that is what I really think the Youth Advisory Board does. So if you are interested in doing that, making change, I highly encourage you to join. Thank you. Thank you, Jaden. If anyone is interested, please grab a flyer on your way out. And now, let's meet our debaters. Andre, Jaden, Noah, and Sammy. Hello, uh, my name is Noah. I use he, him pronouns. I go to Masterman, and I'm a senior. Hello, I'm Sammy. I use she, her pronouns. I go to master as well, and I'm a senior. Uh, okay, well, I did already talk before, but again, um, my name is Jaden. I go by he, him pronouns. I go to Central High School. 
Um, and I think we're doing great. I'm a 10th grader. Hi, my name is Andre. I use he, him pronouns as well. I go to Central and I'm a sophomore, which is 10th grade. Okay, great. So we'll hear more from them in a minute. First, we want to tell you a bit more about what you're going to see today. So the demonstration debate is our annual event to kick off Philadelphia's middle and high school debate season. So this demonstration will show you what a debate looks and sounds like. We are so grateful for our league members and supporters for keeping our program going. We'd like to thank Pew Charitable Trust, our sponsor for supporting the ASAP debate program. Special thanks to Penn for Youth Debate and the School District of Philadelphia for being wonderful partners. Tonight will be recorded by PSTV. So this will be a full 45 minute round of public forum debate. But tonight, or today, debaters will introduce and explain each speech before they perform it. Each team will have three minutes of prep time that they can break up and use however they want. And you, as the audience, could take notes, which in debate is called flowing. We have given out flow sheets to practice flowing. You can use the sheet or use the back. You can do it in whatever way works for you. But you should take notes during a debate so you can respond to what your opponents are saying. We have also included a public forum guide so that you can follow along on which part of the debate we're in. Normally in a debate round, there is one judge in the room, but today the audience is the judge. So you can decide for yourselves who won. We will hear from Kate Sundin, the debate coach at Academy of Palumbo after the round, who will provide insight on how a judge scores a debate. You also have a sample ballot. <laughs> There's more. It's there. <laughs> The topic today is resolved. The United States federal government should legalize all illicit drugs. This is something that affects us in Philadelphia and across the country. We all know someone whose life has been directly or indirectly impacted by drug addiction. And of course, there are different views on how to solve it. It's completely okay if you aren't following everything that our debaters are saying, it's more important to pay attention to how they're saying it. We already flipped a coin, and it has been decided that Central is pro and Masterman is con. Central will go first. Again, debaters will introduce each speech before performing it. Are you all ready? Okay, great. Central will begin. Hey. Okay. Um, I feel like you guys are hearing a lot of me today. Um, so today I'm going to be fun. I'm the first speaker for Central. I'll be first explaining how a constructive worse works. This is um, the first speech of a debate round, and then my opponents will do on their constructive. So it is four minutes long, and you have arguments, and they're called in public forum debate a lot, contentions. And then you can also have something that I do a lot is subpoints. So a main contention that has, like, say, some subpoints that are sort of like mini contentions. And in my opinion, um, each contention should have a uniqueness, why your argument applies to this um, world. Um, a link, how does your argument relate to the topic? Um, warrant, an explanation um, to why your argument works. And then an impact, why does your argument matter at the end of the day? So um, another thing, a last thing I have right here is um, just make sure to pay attention. Sometimes you may not capture everything like Deborah said, but it's just try to get on and try to get the overall theme of it because that's the main thing in constructive. Um, so yeah, um, let me pull up this timer. Okay, so um, time will begin on my first word. 
Central affirms, our first contention is the war on drugs. This has two subpoints. A, racial disparities. Swire 22 finds that drug offenses still account for the incarceration of almost 400,000 people. And even though the Hamilton Project 19 shows that black and white people use and sell drugs at around the same rate, the DPA 20 says that nearly 80% of people in federal prison for drug offenses are black or Latino. The ACLU 20 shows that black people are 3.6 times more likely than white people to be arrested for marijuana possession. Legalization solves for this, as ACLU 20 states that legalized marijuana had lower rates of disparities to marijuana possession arrests being 1.7 times. Legalization also removed all penalties that comes with such drugs. Now, there are manifold impacts to this. One is decreased mass incarceration. According to the DPA 18, 2.7 million children are growing up in the U.S. household without one or more parents incarcerated. Two-thirds of these parents are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses. This is compounded by Fegan 19, who states broken families earn and experience lower levels of education achievement. As we established earlier, these skew against black and Latino people as they are arrested more and pushes them farther back into society. Our second impact is the DPA 18 also states one in 13 black people of voting ages are denied the right to vote because of laws that disenfranchise people with felony convictions. Unquote, because of unequal arresting rates, the U.S. consistently denies black and Latino people access to vote, to have a voice in their own government. For the U.S. to live up to its democracy, we need to think about changing our current laws on drug legalization. Subpoint B is relocation. The Uni United States drug policies are failing. Lesser 18 states that up to 75% of people who get into prison due to drugs are reoffended after their release. However, revenue from legalization can combat these issues. As Miran 18 states, all told, drug legalization could generate up to $106 billion in annual budgetary gains for federal, state, and local governments by decreasing drug enforcement and spending increase to taxing revenue. This money will be repurposed into treatment as Miran continues, early experience suggests that governments will reallocate rather than reduce those expenditures. Marijuana legalization framework in the United States in New York illustrates this trend. As Stingland 21 states, New York anticipates receiving $350 million in yearly tax revenues and has committed to dedicating 40% to adult education, mental health, substance abuse treatment, and economic equity programs. The impact of the implementation of effective the, the impact of this is the implementation of effective drug pro programs. The United States Department of Health 03 writes, if effective prevention programs were implemented nationwide, substance abuse initiation would decline by for 1.5 million youth. Our second contention is research access. Currently, oppressive laws written 60 years ago by politicians instead of doctors restrict which drugs can be researched based on flawed understandings. ABA 20 explains, the DEA federally defines Schedule 1 drugs as having no currently accepted medical use in treatment, despite many studies showing potential therapeutic value. Burke Shine 17 elaborates, a Schedule 1 drug controlled substance is so strictly regulated that it's almost impossible for clinical researchers to study. Thankfully, legalization would erase these destructive barriers. Enabling research is critical. As King 13 explains, a small proof study conducted in patients with treatment PTSD found 80% of MDAA patients showed clinical benefits. These results replication in other groups in other countries, which would be difficult under current regulation. Thus, by allowing treatment, you are curing the lives of 4 million individuals at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs 14 states. About 12 million dots in the U.S. have PTSD in a given year, and NBC 14 explains 33% of people have PTSD are resistant to treatment. By voting pro, you can give these people access to proper medical needs. Thank you. Hello. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to do the second constructive, which is exactly the same as what you explained. So, except we're negating. Is everyone ready? Yeah, we're good. Awesome. Starting in three, two, one. We negate. Contention one is coca production. The key ingredient in the production of coca plant, primarily grown in South According to the UN, coca production uses 30% of cultivated land in the Amazon region. Tragically, this farming process is devastating to ecosystems. 
The UN reports that when cocaine demand grew significantly in the 70s, close to 700,000 hectares of land were used for coca farming. And Burns 15 finds that in the early 21st century, almost 300,000 more were cleared. This process destroys the water supply. UN05 reports that coca growing areas often have less access to safe drinking water. At the height of cocaine demand in the 80s, Peruvian coca farms dumped 30 million liters of acid into rivers per year. And Burns 15 finds that one year in Colombia saw 81,000 tons of toxic chemicals used. Legalizing cocaine is disastrous, as Spilling 95 writes that drug prohibition has forced consumers to seek out specialized sellers who can... Hold on. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to go back five seconds. Legalizing cocaine is disastrous, as Spilling 95 writes that drug prohibition has forced consumers to seek out specialized sellers who can therefore charge extremely high prices. Minetta 10 furthers that drug penalties fr frequently spur individuals struggling with addiction to get the might never seek. Over a third of all treatment referrals are from the criminal justice system. That's why Calkins 2000 writes that drug prohibition has significantly reduced cocaine usage, and in recent years, the cocaine epidemic has reached a plateau with lower rates of new users. Kilmer 17 confirms cocaine use has drastically declined in recent years. This is key, as according to Pedago 12, the international drug trade is fueled by the massive demand from the United there are two impacts. First is biodiversity. As Burns 15 finds that toxification of watersheds raises a serious concern for biodiversity. UN92 explains that a coca production has killed a massive number of fish in surrounding areas. Overall, the UN reports that coca cultivation in the 70s was responsible for the extinction of several marine species. Tragically, Burns 15 finds that the northern Andes, where most coca is produced, is the most species-rich region on Earth. And UN22 finds that over 3 billion people depend on marine biodiversity for their lives. The second impact is drinking water. World Bank 16 explains that indigenous peoples in Latin America are 25% less likely to have access to clean water. This is devastating as Barlow 13 terminalizes that more children die of waterborne disease than AIDS, malaria, and war together. Contention two is pharma. Legalizing drugs places control in the hands of pharmaceutical companies. According to Fertz Iger 94, following legalization, each pharmaceutical company would rush to market its own of the newly legalized drugs. That wouldn't be all, though. Fertz Iger furthers that because chemists could experiment without fear of criminal sanction, companies would funnel money into research and development, attempting to find a class of compounds with better highs. This is disastrous as pharma companies will always have a financial incentive to create of drugs possible because once addicted, consumers cannot decide to stop purchasing the product. Empirics agree. Humphreys 18 reports that following legalization in the Netherlands, marijuana potency more than doubled, followed by a surge in people seeking treatment for marijuana related problems. Thankfully, this can't happen in the status quo, as Fertig 21 explains that illegal drugs don't have the infrastructure to produce the high potency products that have flourished in state legal markets. Regulation wouldn't work. Sabbath 21 finds it empirically that tobacco and alcohol industries have worked to promote ineffective regulation in, for, in place of enforceable laws. Lopez 17 explains that opioid producers have spent more than $880 million lobbying to stop new regulation. That's why Lopez finds that though we are in the middle of an opioid epidemic, the federal government has given drug companies the power in how their products should be regulated. The impact is overdoses. As Harvard 22 reports that most of the 100,000 overdoses in the past year were due to opioids, which built their consumer base on advertising and lobbying. Thus, we negate. Thank you. Okay. What? I actually don't think it's a microphone problem. I think it's a me problem. Um, <laughs> but. Okay. Um, do you want to explain, um, CROSS? Should we explain it together? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, Crossfire is basically a period of three minutes where you're asking your opponent questions based on their constructive. Do you yeah. want to expand at all? Um, yeah. The question should ha either have two purposes. A, to clarify anything in their case that you didn't really get, or... Because you can't like rebut their case if you don't get what they're saying. So one, clarification. And then two, to maybe poke holes or fallacies in their argument and question them in crossfire. Sort of like a preview of the rebuttal. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, you can take first question. OK. Um, and we'll my, start when you're my ready. Ta my time will begin my first word. 
I have it. All right. Okay. Can you explain how um, your second impact to the first contention um, about drinking water, how does that relate to um, what you talked about prior? What do you mean? Like, how, how, how do you access um, your um, impact there? Okay, right. So we tell you um, that the U.S. drug trade heavily fuels coca production in Latin America, and we also tell you that in the past, many, many tons of toxic chemicals have been poured into, like, watersheds in Latin America, which toxifies their watersheds and, and restricts access for safe drinking water. Does that clarify? Do you have more questions? Um, yes. Um, do you have any questions for me? Sure. Um, okay, let's look at your C2. All of these people who have PTSD, right, how many are going to get access from this treatment? So you say there's like 4 million people whose lives are going to be saved from this treatment. Um, but how can you ensure that all of them are actually going to access this treatment, especially when you say 33% of them are resistant to treatment? Well, it shows the untapped... Um it shows the untapped studies that we don't have because of um, unlegal, because of not legalization. So we ha we don't know how many people will get these treatments because, of course, we haven't legalized drugs yet. Okay. But we can assume that it could be widespread because um, because when we legalize, these things can get out and there can be research done on it. Okay, so. Just two things. You agree that one, you don't have access to the entirety of the four million, and two, there's already research that has been done. Yes, but for the research, you can is ask the question. Okay. Um, on this, um, on your pharmacy thing, how how do you know that pharmacies will make drugs more important? Uh, because you only give me like a couple of past examples, but how how is it like more of a certainty that they will do that? Do what? Make them more potent? Yes, make them more potent. I mean, we've seen it happen with like marijuana legalization and opioids, but also we tell you that they're empirically very financially driven, and so they don't really care about the well-being of their consumer base, and they've spent over $800 million lobbying to make more potent and harmful drugs. So we would presume that if you were to legalize all drugs, that would extend to those drugs as well. Okay. Um, do you have a question? Sure. Um, okay, on reallocation, the money we spend on criminalizing drugs right now, how do we know that wouldn't just be spent on more law enforcement? Like, you say, um, for New York, for example, that they shifted, or they're going to shift the allocation of the money. How do you know that for sure, and how do you know that it wouldn't be shifted to another facet of law enforcement? Okay, so one, you can look into our Marin evidence, which says that early experience suggests that government will reallocate rather than ex these expenditures. Um, also, you can look into the past as New York and Colorado, um, when they um, legalized only marijuana, though, uh, when they legalized only marijuana, they did reinvest the, the funds from that. They did reinvest it into these programs. That is time. Okay, so the next speech here is the rebuttal. Uh, essentially here, you listen to, you listen to your opponent's constructive and you break down argument by argument how it's wrong, how you're right and they're wrong, essentially. Um, the second rebuttal uh, has some extra components, but the first rebuttal is essentially just that. Um, so I'm going to begin now. Uh, let me get my timer. All right. So on their first contention about environmental impacts, we actually turn it to our side. This means that we are arguing that the environmental impacts are actually worse without drug legalization than with it. The problem that my opponents outline is actually one of the unregulated cocoa production. Burns Edel 16 finds that unregulated usage of illegal fertilizers and pesticides and illicit crop growth results in the Sorry, my, my microphone? Okay. Uh, unregulated usage of illegal fertilizers and pesticides and illicit crop growth results in the direct poisoning of wildlife. My mic keeps cut. Sorry. Uh, can I, I'm just going to restart if that's okay. Thanks. Well, I'm just going to leave this up. Okay. Yeah. All right. From the start again. Um, on their first contention about environmental impacts, we're actually to turn it to our side. This means that we are arguing that the environmental impacts are actually worse without drug legalization than with it. The problem in my opponent's outline is actually one of unregulated cocoa production. Burns Eagle 16 finds that the unregulated usage of illegal fertilizers and pesticides 
growth results in the direct poisoning of wildlife and the indirect toxification of watersheds. This is only caused because drugs are illegal, as Ellsworth Protein finds that because marijuana use remains illegal. Uh, okay. Um, states like California cannot regulate or impose environmental restrictions on water, uh, fertilizer, and pesticide use. This would make currently illegal drugs no different than other agricultural products environmentally, and therefore, on the second contention about pharma, we have two responses. First, drug decriminalization actually reduces the potency or strength of drugs by making them cheap. Putting their overdose impacts to our side. Rule 18 describes the iron law of prohibition. The more intense the law enforcement, the more potent the drugs will become. Really explains that this happens because concentrated drugs are more efficiently smuggled, transported, and are sold, and are easier for the consumer to conceal, transport, and consume without detection. This means that legalization actually reduces the potency of drugs, as it allows less potent drugs to be economically viable. Really explains that the rise of fentanyl laced drugs has Oh, I gotta be for okay. Um, the, <laughs> excuse me. Um, this means that legalization actually reduces the potency of drugs as it allows less potent drugs to be economically viable. Worley explains that the rise of fentanyl laced drugs has largely been a result of drugs being illegal. Since fentanyl is much smaller per dose, it is far cheaper and easier to traffic. The result is that cartels lace their drugs with fentanyl and other highly potent opioids in order to reduce the quantity that they have to traffic. The impact here is severe. The Wisconsin Department of Health finds that fentanyl and similar synthetic opioids are more potent than other opioids and have been driving the increase in over. In fact, the CDC finds that most overdoses involve synthetic opioids. Drug legalization solves this problem, as there would no longer be these incentives to increase potency, and fentanyl-laced drugs would all but disappear from the market. This means that most current overdoses would disappear just due to the removal of fentanyl-laced drugs. Second, their potency arguments they present have, have problems. The author of the Netherlands study himself simply advocates for the regulation of marijuana potency. He says that potency will rise in both illegal and legal markets, and further argues simply that states should regulate marijuana potency. Since regulation is impossible in illegal markets, he is essentially advocating for drug legalization. Additionally, this only relates to relatively safe potency increases in marijuana. They don't give you any evidence to disprove the issues of potency increases with opioids. They claim that tobacco regulation in the U.S. has not worked, yet the American Lung Association finds that smoking rates have dropped by 68% since 1965 in the U.S., clearly demonstrating that regulation does work in the United States. Um, and this can work with other drugs other than tobacco as well. Ultimately, legalization is the only way to decrease drug potency. So to go over this again, first, we explained to you that the reason there are negative environmental impacts right now from cocaine is just due to the fact that it's illegal, which incentivizes the use of illegal farming practices that result in toxic environments, contamination of the water supply, and negative environmental impacts, and deforestation. Um, and, and secondly, when under their potency argument, basically illegal drugs have more incentive to be highly potent than normal drugs, and than, than, than drugs when they're legalized, and also when they're legalized, you can regulate the potency. That's That's... Um, can I? Yeah. Um, can we? Oh, sorry. Okay, nice. Sure. Hello. Yeah, okay. We're going to do a little sound check. Sound check. Uh, this sounds great. This is much better. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I want to check this. Yeah, this is a lot better. All right, awesome. Uh, could we see the card about... Uh, most synthetic, uh, most overdoses are from synthetic opioids. Sure. 
So this is the common. So here we have the C CDC drug overdose uh, stuff. Can I just show you on my? Can I just show you on my computer? Yeah, that's chill. I'll come over. Right. I guess I'll explain that. You can call for cards in a debate round, which is like calling for evidence. If you think your opponent's evidence are questionable and something to be questioned, then you can call for it and get what we call a card, which is basically their evidence. Or if you just didn't hear it, like me. <laughs> yeah. I hate this real quick. All right, so now we're going to take a little bit of prep time. So that's just we're going to run the timer. Uh, we're going to talk for a couple of seconds, write some stuff down, and then we'll get right back to it. Um, and we mark down. We have three minutes of prep time, and that's all the time we can use in the round. So we're starting that now. Alrighty, and we're back. That was 30 seconds. So I'm going to write that down. 30 seconds. Cool. Here we go. Everyone ready? Oh, yeah. So second rebuttal is pretty much the same as the last rebuttal. You're responding to your but first, usually, you want to look at their responses uh, to your case. And you want to do what's called frontlining, which is basically defending your case um, and talking about that and why you win. You don't need to extend your case completely um, in second rebuttal, but it's good to get that out there. And then also, depending on how much time you have, it might be good to introduce at the end of the speech weighing, which is just an explanation for why your arguments are more important. That's not necessary in second rebuttal, but it's very cool if you can do it. Um, great. So we're going to start now. Starting in three, two, one. Let's start on our first contention about coca production. They tell you to turn the argument because it gets worse uh, without legalization because there's unregulated use of illegal fertilizers. The nuance that they miss is that this is not farming that's happening in the U.S. It, uh, coca must be produced on the northern side of a mountain in the Andes. That means that you're never going to see that, that the U.S. is able to implement more once it's legalized. Furthermore, we would tell you there's always going to be economic incentive for these companies to keep these bad farming practices. That's why you see bad pesticides used even in legal foods within the U.S. So at that point, there's no regulation that they can prove and they can't turn the argument. On our second contention about pharma, they tell you that drugs, when they are illegal, are concentrated in close amounts. However, they ignore the empirical evidence give you from the Netherlands, which tells you that in the past, marijuana potency has almost doubled after legalization. Then second, they tell you that fentanyl is, uh, the, is the cause of most overdose deaths. The thing is that all of their evidence is about overall synthetic opioids, not just fentanyl, meaning we have no actual quantification of how many of these op opioids uh, are, are from fentanyl or illegal. These opioids were literally marketed by these companies. They were illegal drugs. And so at that point, we can see that the worst that overdoses get are when the drug is legal. Then finally, they say that the Netherlands study says that regulation can solve, but they ignore the nuance that regulation hasn't happened in the nuance. It hasn't happened in the Netherlands because there's literally never been any regulation because they can just lobby the government. Go to their case. Let's start off on their first contention about war on drugs and on racial disparities. We have a couple of responses. First, decriminalization is imminent and is coming soon. Black 22 reports that Biden has just pardoned all convicted marijuana users and by the end of his term, will likely decriminalize marijuana with the support of the attorney general. That's key as the vast majority of drug arrests made are marijuana offenses. At best, their impact lasts for the next two years. Meanwhile, ours lasts like for the next century. But then we would tell you that second, their entire argument is changing anyway, because according to NAA 15, the U.S. has recently changed sentencing guidelines to allow people incarcerated for drug charges to be early released, which has affected thousands, meaning the problem is already being solved. But then third, the argument has no link because legalization doesn't solve for inequality empirically. According to Sabbath 20, after Colorado's legalization of cannabis, African Americans were still more than twice as likely to be arrested for marijuana offenses like DUIs than whites. And fourth, you can actually turn the argument to our side because Cooper 20 finds that increased drug consumption could lead to other crimes like DUIs, leading to more interactions with police for people of color. Thus, Cooper finds that in states like Maine and Vermont, 
racial disparities in weed arrests actually got worse after legalization passed. But then fifth, turn the argument to our side again. Because remember our case where pharma companies advertise new, more potent drugs, that dis disproportionately harms communities of color. And so then you're going to see them being advertised to at a greater rate. But then on their second sub point about reallocation, first, taxes won't be implemented because pharma companies will lobby the government like we tell you in case. But second, law enforcement will literally take the returns. According to Badger 20, the average share of general expense has increased by millions of dollars over the past 30 years despite a decline in violent crime. All the money is going to end up going to... But then fourth, there's no impact anyway, because uh, according to Lopez 19, the American rehab system is trapped in the 12-step program used to treat alcohol addiction, even though there's little evidence that it actually works for drugs. And according to Man 21, the rehab industry is driven by profit rather than proper medical care, and that people can often not for the treatment if it's out there. That means that none of their impacts will actually materialize. But then in their second engine about research. First, we would tell you that we have no idea how many people actually can pay for the treatment even if it's out there. But second, there's no link because the U.S. is currently testing drugs like MDMA. According to Newer 21, before MDMA can be approved for therapeutic use, the FDA needs a new trial which is currently underway and approval could come as early as 2020. That means the pr problem is already being solved without legalization. But then th we would tell you that you can turn the argument because FDA approval is better because it means that professionals are watching over the drug use and making sure that it's not, like actually used for good therapeutic uses and that's much better for treating PTSD. Thus, you are always going to vote con. Can I call for a few cards? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the uh, police work, police directions, law enforcement returns, the, the uh, uh, treatment program. All right, go. Cool. Come over, over here. Scooper 20 for the Marshall Project. Widespread drug abuse. All right. People of color. Um, then what's the next one? Uh, the next one is the law enforcement takes the returns. Yeah, the average share of general expenditures. Uh, is there anything? Is there anything tying that into drugs? No, this is just general okay. police. Okay, okay. Uh, and then anything else? Uh, yeah, and then the last thing is the F is the FDA treatment. Uh, here, a bunch of articles from May. Uh, or MDMA can be approved. Trial is currently underway. Oh wait. Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna pay. Okay. I did not get to weigh. Okay. We're gonna start. Alright. Start... Well, we have crossfire. We'll do the crossfire oh, first, okay. though. We'll, prep. we'll have crossfire then prep. Oh yeah, crossfire. Alright. Uh, is everyone ready for a second cross? No. Are you ready for a second cross? Yeah, yeah. Alright. All right, so, so now, now, second speakers have a cross. Same thing pretty much as the first cross, except for now we have a little more stuff to talk about. Yeah. Do you want first question? You can go ahead. Okay. Um, so, you're, you, you argue that uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, you, you demonstrate that, um, uh, so, so actually you argue in the Netherlands that, that the regulation is not like important is not necessary, necessarily going to happen? Yeah, it didn't happen. Okay. Marijuana potency more than doubled. So, and you argue that lobbying is what's preventing this regulation, right? Yeah, exactly. Like the so, opioid epidemic and cigarettes before it, these companies, when they have legal substances, they advertise them, they lobby governments, and no regulation ever so you passes. So you discuss uh, cigarettes here. Um, how, do you, how do you counter the fact that the regulation did, in fact, happen despite the lobbying and resulted in, in, in only a third of the number of smokers happened today? It happened like 50 years later. I'm not willing to lose all those lives. It happened a lot faster than that. And besides, the status quo is not going is, is, is to save any lives at all. Yeah, it is. Because we're seeing that right now, um, these pharma companies aren't able to advertise drugs like cocaine and heroin. They aren't able to double potency of these awful drugs. And they're not able to research new drugs that are even more addictive. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, let's look at your turn on our first contention. You tell us that like, legalization is somehow going to increase uh, the ability for the regulation around illegal farming practices. How does that happen? Uh 
so when you have you already have an illegal supply chain going on because you're already doing stuff illegally. At that point, there's no incentive for you to stick with using legal, um, uh, with legal farming practices. And in fact, there is an incentive for you to go into remote areas and disrupt the local popula- the local wildlife and biodiversity. Um, so if you have it, if you have a legal supply chain going on. And you have regulation, you you have an incentive to do everything legally because you no longer have to hide your farming, greatly reducing costs, and regulation will likely also ensure that the farming is being done in a. Now you 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 do argue that you know these um, the farming isn't happening in the U.S. So how would the regulation impact that? I, I want to I want you to keep in mind here that the um, these pesticides and fertilizers are illegal where they are being done in South America. That's what our source says. Is they're well, yeah, but coca can only be grown in those areas because it needs to be grown on the wet side of a mountain in the northern Andes. So you, you can't like move it over to California where laws are suddenly going to stop it. That's where, that's where the plant is grown. That's not our argument. Well, that's our argument is that if, if it's legalized, argument. You, have the whole, you have the whole supply chain legalized. If it's legalized in the U.S., it's going to be legalized in the, in the producing countries as well. U.S. has huge geopolitical influence over over the Americas. That, that's a new warrant, and also I don't believe that. Okay. Besides that, it also has impact on California because California is where marijuana is grown uh, yeah. in the United States. Illicit marijuana is mostly grown in California. Yeah, but the coca plant is specific to our evidence. It, it, we we have marijuana impact, and we also have the cocoa plant impact because it's it's going. Okay, time. We're going to run some prep right now, so, yeah.
Okay. Hello, hello. Okay, for summary, um, what are you supposed to do during summary? Um, Self-explanatory, kind of, kind of, kind of a summary of the entire round. Um, you're supposed to be, um, especially in first summary, frontlining your case and also going to, I guess, attack your opponent's case, um, which they have frontlined earlier. And then you, what you also really want to do is you also really want to weigh and say why your impacts matter more than your opponent's. Um, I believe that's all I can think of right now. You can also, um, like, if you're, you're focusing on, you, the, you're trying to make your argument matter the most. It doesn't really matter which argument. It could be one or two arguments, but you're trying to make your argument matter the most. Okay. So let's first start on our case. Um, they talked about, actually, no, let's first start on their case. So they first um, talked about on cocoa production about like how this doesn't apply um, to other countries out of the U.S. We're talking about the supply chain here. That's what our argument is talking about, the supply chain. So yes, we are talking about the um, products that do come into the um, cocaine and that stuff. Therefore, they are still regulated. Um, next, on the, to their, uh, onto their second contention, um, they have this lobbying argument. Lobbying won't really, um, lobbying won't really happen because that has not been shown empirically. Um, also, they have evidence uh, about um, our logic here is that because there's more intense restrictions, you have um, people doing synthetic. Um, opioids, and because they have synthetic opioids, they need to compound the um, potency into smaller drugs, which then get smuggled across. I mainly feel like it was a uh, contention of not understanding our argument, because when they have um, smaller regulation, then they are able to, when you have more restricted legalization, then they're able to go across. Um, Next, we're going to look on to our um, second contention about reallocation. So first, they said that law enforcement spending has gone up due to re that law enforcement spending has gone up due to reallocation. Well, we say that's just due towards the drug war that law enforcement spending has gone up. And also, they mentioned something attacking our impact about alcohol prevention programs. We're focusing on um, drug prevention programs, and that is why we get access to the impact of. 1.5 million youth, million youth um, um, that would have been, um, 1.5 million youth that would have been um, not addicted to drugs because of these 1.5 million youth as we look at our U.S. Department of Health 03 rights. Um, also, law enforcement on thing there is they have as general, we have a specific case referring specifically to drug prevention programs. And then lastly, on our first contention about racial disparities, um, they um, say that drug uh, impotency increases with people of color. We already refuted that when I refuted their case that no drugs do not get more potent. Pharmacies will not have an increase to, the pharmacies will not have an incentive to increase more drugs, rather to reallocate. Um, and then lastly, on to some weighing, we want you to um, collapse on our second um, on our sub point B about reallocation. And we are really focusing on scale right here. We're focusing on scope and we're focusing on probability because when you do reallocate, which is what we have shown, which is what has been shown in the past and shown empirically, we are going to have increased drug programs. And these programs will help 1.5 million people. That's 1.5 million people that would not have been addicted to drugs in the first place, which is what we say in case. And that, um, in the future ultimately saves their lives. So thank you. All right, we're gonna take some prep time. Just running prep. Starting in three, two, one.
All right, we used about a minute and 57 seconds of prep time, so we have like 33 seconds left for final focus. Okay, summary, second summary is essentially the exact same as first summary, except you don't have to front line. Um, at this point, by summary, you shouldn't be introducing any new arguments or warrant cards. Um, yeah, there's really not much to explain about second summary. All right. Just a quick off-time roadmap. I'm going to first go over our case, then their case, and then I will weigh. Okay, is everybody ready? Are you all ready? Okay, cool. <laughs> Starting in three, two, one. Start off on the turn in our first contention. They completely drop all warranting, which means they have absolutely no offense for the rest of the round. You cannot vote off of it in final focus. Now let's go on to our second contention, which is what we are collapsing on. We tell you that when you affirm Big Pharma takes control of the drug market, this is really bad because of lobbying and potency. They extend two responses. First, they say it's not empirically true. We've extended through every single speech that the opioid crisis, um, they spent over $880 million lobbying for ineffective so this is just completely untrue. At that point, you're buying the empirics, but then they say that synthetic opioids cause overdoses. But at the point where all of these opioid addictions always stem from big pharma, opioids are marketed by big pharma, you buy that they are the root cause and ultimately worse. But then you also have to think about the um, Netherlands empiric where we tell you that marijuana potency more than doubled. They completely ignored this empiric. It's the most important empiric in the round and you should extend it all the way through. Then let's look at their case. They go for their subpoint B on reallocation. There's two problems with this argument. First, they drop the response that decriminalization is imminent. We tell you that Black 22 reports that Biden has just pardoned all convicted marijuana users and by the end of the term will likely decriminalize marijuana and, this, um, and with the support of Attorney Garland. That means at best their impact will last for the next two years. The fund going to jails. Meanwhile, our impact about pharma could spiral out of control and define the next few decades much like the opioid epidemic, making it much more important to solve now. But then they drop the response that existing treatment doesn't work. Lopez 19 explains that the American rehab system is trapped in the 12-step program and used to treat alcohol addiction, even though there's little evidence it works for drugs. Man 21 explains that the rehab industry is driven by profit rather than proper medical care, and that it's often impossible to sell or to tell legitimate rehab programs from unethical. Then they also drop the turn on research. We tell you, um, the, the newer evidence tells you that before MDMA can be approved by therapeutic, therapeutic use, the FDA needs a trial which is currently underway and approval could come as nearly as 2023, which means we're already solving for their impacts right now. But then you turn it because FDA approval it will always be better. Cervic 21 tells you that as MDMA inches closer to approval, careful supervision from therapists can overcome indiscriminate use. That means that regardless, you're going to be voting for us on our side and theirs. This would restrict NDMA to medical uses rather than just completely legalizing it. Then on weighing, first our argument comes before theirs. The root problem is addiction, and pharma advertising would make peop uh, more people addicted. That will always outweigh more than treatment because some of those people won't get treatment. Second, we outweigh on time frame. A minuscule increase in treatment programs will never have the lasting impact of ceding control to pharmaceutical megacorporations. At that point, you're voting for us, both on their case, ours, and lives. Thank you. All right, so now we're moving on to the grand crossfire. This is where all speakers uh, from both sides uh, have a crossfire basically together. It's basically the same as other crossfires, except that everyone involved. Hi. All right. Y'all can get first question. Can we start? So um, how does your argument about marijuana decriminalization to opioids, which are the main thing around. What do you mean? Like, okay, wait, wait, wait. Decriminalization is not the evidence that we have on our, like, our side of the case. That's what we put on your side of the case. The yeah. thing about marijuana on our case is the Netherlands empiric about potency. So you're just, like, confusing those two cards, I think. You, you're, one of your responses to our um, argument about racial discrepancies is that 
uh, is that marijuana is going to be decriminalized anyways, which means that our case is not going to be relevant in two years. Yeah. Um, well, your argument is that right now a lot of money is being spent on jailing people for largely marijuana offenses. And so the argument is within the next two years, those drugs will likely be decriminalized, meaning that, that those funds, if they are going to be reallocated, could already be reallocated in the status quo. We don't need to legalize every drug to have that happen. Uh, so you're saying there, uh, you're, you're saying that marijuana is going to be decriminalized by the states? No, uh, by Biden and Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland. So it's still going to be illegal in most of the U.S.? No. If, if there's a federal decriminalization, and then we also tell, read the, you the evidence that um, the majority of Americans agree on drug uh, criminalization, and even red states are trending towards complete decriminalization. Okay. So again, how does that relate to opioids? Well, because then we don't have to spend that money on jails and sending people to jail for marijuana offenses. And then, wait, it doesn't relate to opioids. It relates to your argument okay. about, about reallocation. Okay, okay. Do you have a question? Yeah. How are you today? <laughs> All right. Yeah, this is our first time running this, uh, running this I case. I was going to say I'm great, but I mean, I'm excited to go home and sleep. But um, uh, um, so I guess if no one has any questions, are we all good with questions? Yeah, we can just jump right into Final Focus. Do you want to ask a question, Noah? I think I'm good. Okay, okay, I think we're good. Yeah, we can we can concede the rest of the time. All right, cool. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Yeah. All right, we'll go straight into Final Focus. So Final Focus is essentially where you focus on your most important argument of the round and elaborate on how important its, its impacts are, especially, and you want to tell a story. This is where you make a more emotional appeal to the judge and also where you essentially condense further your arguments that you made in summary. If it's not in summary, it can't be in final focus with very, very few exceptions uh, relating to like unethical practices by your opponents. Um, so uh, my time's gonna begin in a moment. So essentially the core of our argument is gonna be about r racial inequalities. Um, my opponents have responded to this in a few ways. Uh, they they claim that you know decriminalization decriminalization is um, on marijuana. Again, our argument is primarily related to opioids, um, and and we we mentioned this in summary about how it's opioids. Uh, and then the other thing they said is the American Rehab Program. Uh, their argument uh, we dropped that argument. We didn't. We responded to it in summary. If you remember. If I remember correctly, we discussed about we discussed how we're talking about drug prevention programs, programs to keep people from going into drugs, uh, from getting into drugs initially. Um, so that doesn't relate to rehab. Um, so basically, the argument here is that drug laws disproportionately impact Black and Latino people and other minorities, and the result is that. It, um, there is mass incarceration of these people, um, which was, and since black people are three times more likely to be incarcerated, this results in racial disparities. There are 2.7 million uh, American kids with parents in uh, with parents in prison, and the result is it, it, the result is that we have uh, massive negative educational impacts and uh, upper mobility impacts throughout uh, throughout life, and it also is extremely expensive. Our reallocation case describes to you how. Um, how it costs over $100 billion a year to maintain this system. This money could be diverted to other things, and we've empirically proven to you that it has done so in other cases where drugs have been legalized. Now, now there, so basically our argument here is that we can save 1.5 million youth every year from getting into drugs in the first place with this money that we are saving. And we will save that money. So you you vote to our side clear on this. This this out, outweighs all of their case on their environmental impact thing. Again, we reiterate how um, if it's if it's legalized, it's going to result in more regulation, which is going to result reduce the environmental impact. Um, uh, th that's clear. That flows to our side, and the potency argument is also okay. Awesome. We're going to take our last thirty seconds of prep starting now.
All right, that's time. So here's the last speech of the round, second final focus. Um, I summarized all of the arguments in the round and why I think our side won. Awesome, thank you. Uh, cool. Starting in three, two, one. Both sides agree. This debate comes down to who can help stop overdoses better. When you vote, you have to decide whether overdoses are due to legalization or not. That means that just one piece of evidence is key. The argument that opioids, a legal drug, are the majority of overdoses in the status quo. That means that when pharma companies get control and are able to lobby the government to advertise and to stop all regulations on their legal substances, that's when you see the majority, the majority of overdoses occur. That 100,000 overdoses in the status quo, the, major the majority of them are from, uh, are, are from legalized drugs. At that point, you're always voting for us. Talk about, let's talk about reallocation, their argument. First, they do not properly extend any of their warrants in final focus. They don't explain why their argument or is true or why those funds get reallocated. There is no incentive analysis as to why that happens and no empirics as to why that happens. And so at that point, it's hard to buy. But second, we would tell you that our decriminalization response is incredibly underhandled. When we tell you that decriminalization is going to happen within the next two years, and also all marijuana offenses are already pardoned, as well as the fact that many states are literally going towards decriminalization or have already legalized or have already decriminalized. At that point, you are going to see that the, uh, the funds can be reallocated within the next two years. That means that their time frame is ridiculously small and our impact is always going to outweigh. But let's go to our case. On pharma, our evidence is really clear. In places like the Netherlands, when pharma has gained control over marijuana, it has vastly increased, it has almost doubled potency. That's really bad because then they're able to not only advertise for these drugs, but also create new strains and new drugs completely, which are more addictive and lead to more. Now, they don't do any weighing, and they don't respond to any of our weighing. Sammy tells you, in summary, that our argument comes before them, theirs, because the root problem is addiction, and when these pharma companies are doing advertising, that stops all of their, like, preventative measures. But second, we outweigh on time frame, because a minuscule increase in programs will never have the lasting impact of ceding control to pharmaceutical megacorporations. And you are always voting neg. Thank you, debaters. I'd love for us to all give them a big round of applause for all their impressive work. Thank you all so much. Um, I'd like to quickly introduce Kate Sundin. She's the debate coach at Academy Palumbo. She's going to be speaking as the judge and tell us what judges might be looking for in a debate. All right, um, I'm going to go try and go super fast, but before I start, a quick plug. Um, in addition to the Wednesday debates, there's Saturday debates that you can participate in, and upcoming, we have a couple in December. One is the Lascal College High School Invitational, and that is on December 10th. And the other is um, the second PCFL league, which is a different league from the ones that you guys debated in on Wednesday. Um, that's going to actually be at Central High School um, on December 17th. So if you need more information about that, talk to uh, Deborah and Destiny about that, or me too. I'm happy to answer questions too. Um, okay, so this was a really great debate with a lot of really great points that were made. Um, but I... You, I, I heard you guys say that this is your first time using this case. But you didn't like use this specific case. Yeah, so that showed. <laughs> because I think that if you had more experience using this case, the main mistake that I saw you make was that you didn't extend your reallocation. So what you did was you reiterated your reallocation points, but you didn't extend your reallocation points. And I think that if you had taken the time to extend and really explain in second speech why reallocation will happen, because right now the war on drugs is still happening, right? So there's billions of dollars that are still being used. So even though decriminalization is currently happening, 
the fact that the war on drugs is still happening means that there's billions of dollars that are you know still being locked up in in this you know endless useless war right so you have billions of dollars that would that would then be present and would absolutely be allocated and so then if you really hammered that the hundreds of different ways that social and the increase in money and social programs benefits particularly BIPOC communities right in terms of um, not just in terms of like drug prevention right but in terms of education and social programs and community programs and all these other things that also flow towards drug prevention right without the an ancillary benefits um, I think that you really could, you, you actually could have potentially won the day on this. Um, in addition, if you had started out with something that's called a framework, for those of you guys who don't know, a framework is um, something that you set up at the start of a case, being like, this is judge, this is how we want you to view this case. And basically set up a framework that said, we need to prioritize anything that's going to reduce or um, reduce, ameliorate, or mitigate um, systemic racism in the United States over anything else, then what happens is that your real allocation argument becomes more important than their environment argument. Right? <laughs> it was, it, it's something you could have done, but like definitely you should have extended the allocation. Because, um, because Khan did a really amazing job in the second speech, and I think like you, like, round of applause, like, you did like a really classic, you did a really classic second speech that I think almost any judge facing seeing this round would be like, check, 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 check. You hit all, you know, you did a really good job um, addressing the other side and then also shoring up your own side. And I think like, you know, if you guys don't have enough time to do both, you want to prioritize a thing that's going to protect your own case bo most, but you really do want to try and shoot for doing both, attacking them and defending yourself. Um, well, a couple other su super fast things. Um, try and avoid having generic cards that don't tie in directly to the resolution because in a close debate, a judge is going to notice that. Right? And if, you're, if the other team calls you on it and be like, yeah, that may be true, but this doesn't really to the drug war or oh that may be true but this you know applies to say netherlands instead of like who says it's like the extrapolation doesn't always fly right um you know then and and if the other team is like you know that's the netherlands who said that's who says that's going to happen here you know with how many more million people etc cetera, etc cetera, then the, if it's a really close debate the judge will be like okay i buy that i buy that argument um so watch out for generic um generic cards and um Never let the other side talk you into something in crossfire. Sammy, like, brilliantly was like, well, this is what you mean, right? And you were like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> when it's not really what you meant. <laughs> so ne like, never, ever, 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 ever admit to anything in crossfire. Like, just start out by saying, you're, you're, misre you're misrepresenting what we're saying. Or, I think you don't understand what we're saying. And even if what you end up saying is really similar to what they said, you want the judge to be like, yeah, they really are misrepresenting. They really are. Don't, don't understand. So don't ever fall for that. That was a great tactic. So awesome. All right. That's, that. that's it. I think we have to wrap it up. Okay. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, first of all, thanks again to the School District of Philadelphia for hosting tonight's debate and to Shelley Wolf from PSTV. Um, none of this would have been possible without our colleagues at ASAP. Thank you all so much. And our debate coaches, including Kate Sundin um, from Academy Palomo, Lisa Sheldon, Maggie at Central, Mike, Cam Mike Camison at Masterman. Um, and Destiny has a few announcements. Yes, just a couple of quick announcements before you guys pack up. Our ASAP Debate League is going to begin in just a couple of weeks, and we're really excited to be back in person. So the first high school scrimmage will be Wednesday, November 2nd at Central High School. And then the first middle school scrimmage will be Wednesday, November 9th at Academy of Palumbo. And make sure you check out our weekly e-newsletters for updates and registration info about the tournaments. 
And also, please remember to send us your enrollment forms and student surveys if you haven't done so already. Thank you again so much to our debaters. Can we give them another round of applause? And thank you all for being here and supporting ASAP Debate. Have a great night, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Woo!